that every morning when I feed the birds out mm -hmm. behind our house, I talk to the ducks. Yeah. And they come up to the pond and you know yeah. carry on a little. I've gotten pretty good at. It. I think yeah. they actually understand what I'm saying. It's so why do you tell them? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I times her a cat and she talks back. She had a lot to say last night when we got home. <laughs> she was not happy with us. For leaving well, her so long. Yeah. Well, uh, it's seven o'clock. <laughs> Go ahead and get started, I guess. So last week we kind of finished up with the section um, on the, we had the Sermon on the Mount and then the Miracles of Jesus. And those were kind of two parts, if you remember, and what Jesus said and what Jesus did. Um, and it was bracketed by this verse, very similar on both sides. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. That's a 9.35 and 4. 23, almost exactly the same, uh, almost. And so up to this point, we've had Matthew tell us the genealogy, how we got to Jesus being born, the birth story with the Magi, uh, John the Baptist and Jesus' baptism and temptation, followed by the big sermon, uh, sayings of Jesus all condensed into the Sermon on the Mount, and then works of Jesus, the miracles that he's done. Uh, so before we move on, just because we've got a little bit of a uh, shorter reading tonight, um, I wanted to recap and see if there were any other comments or any other questions um, or any noticings about Matthew chapters one through nine before we move on. You know, when you were your sermon this Sunday on humility, I was going to mention this last week, I wasn't sure, but um, Jesus tells his, you know, perform miracles and then tells them not to tell anybody how much more humble things you get. Mm -hmm. You know, so he was a perfect example of what you were talking about. Sunday morning, I can't say um, that is that's humility. When someone to piss Patrick can say act like well, it's not a big deal, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was just kind of what I was thinking. He came to serve in chapter nine. Yeah, uh, verse twenty-eight and twenty-nine. Um, Jesus uh, comes to the blind man. He said, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they responded, yes. And then he touched and said, be it done to you according to your faith. Hello. Hi. And that, uh, you know, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Be it done to you according to your faith. Mm -hmm. um, that says a lot to me in terms of, you know, it's kind of like I, I am, uh, when he talked to Martha, when he approached Lazarus' house, he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? Mm -hmm. And, uh, be it done to you according to your, I mean, if you have no faith, then what you get is what you're going to get. Be it done to you according to your faith, whether you have faith or you don't have faith. That's some pretty solemn stuff. I like, you know, last week, um, you know, you guys were gone. Okay. We <laughs> talked about uh, how the miracle stories kind of start with this example of incredible faith with the leper who comes to him and says, 
if you want to, you can make me clean. Right. All you have to do is say, I know if you want to, you can make me clean. That's mm -hmm. what it starts with, you know. And the and then the the centurion, yeah, who right. says, "Look, I'm I'm somebody under authority, and even if I even I if I say to somebody, you know, go and do this, he's going to do it. So I know you, who is is the highest authority, can say the word, and it's done. Um, and it, and then it continues to kind of you know the disciples, classically." Are you know ye of little faith in the boat? You know they're they say save us, uh, but they're scared, right? And um, and then the you know I guess he he points out that the blind men, even though they said yes, we believe you could do this, when when Jesus orders them to tell nobody, that they went away and spread the news about him throughout that district. So. He points out, well, they didn't really obey him when he said, don't tell anybody. So it's still kind of, and then, and then finally, the Pharisees say, well, it's because of Satan that he's doing this. Yeah. So it kind of goes from this right. class, this really high example of faith to Pharisees have no faith or, or none of them question that he's doing miracles, by the way, but it's by whose authority and, and the Pharisees saying, well, it's the prince of demons. Uh, I think the part where he said to the, don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder how serious he was about that. Because it'd be hard not were, to. If you were blind and yeah. all of a sudden you can see, you're just not going to sit there quietly. Yeah. Oh, I can't follow that. You'd be hard not to. Yeah. 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 You're going to tell the world. I think the real contrast that Matthew's drawing between these these people, you know, the people of the crowds and the disciples, and then the Pharisees and the way the Pharisees respond is to say, by the ruler, by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. Um, and then Jesus would. So we get then into this next section on discipleship. And so it's only one chapter tonight, but I kind of picked it that way because um, this is its own unit. And it's, it's a discourse to the disciples. And so it has a lot to say to us because we are disciples. And so I think there could be a lot to talk about here. So it's one chapter. But before we get into that, let's pray. God of all things, we thank you for bringing us together here tonight. I thank you for each one in our group. We pray for those who are traveling, uh, who could not be here, um, those who are recovering from a long day, those who are sick, and uh, we ask that you would lift them up in prayer. We uh, pray for your wisdom and your discernment that your Holy Spirit would move in and among us as we discuss your word, enlighten our hearts, and draw us closer together in Christian love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, so last time we stopped with verse 35, so we've got a couple more verses to read in chapter 9 here. Uh, this is the beginning of a new unit um, where Jesus is about to address the disciples. So let's do chapter 9, verse 36, through chapter 10, verse 4. And it'll be a good introduction to the unit. Somebody read that for us? I'll read it. Thank you. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits, to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter. Am I supposed to read that? 
And his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Malphias, and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, 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 Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So we have our first list of the disciples. Um, and this introduction to this section, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So um, what does this is Jesus telling us then as disciples? Do and spread the word. Because people are out there, you know, they're we they're looking for um, they're wanting to hear the word. They're starving. We passed a, uh, a group of people, well, it wasn't a group, there must have been 10,000 of them there. Uh, it, it, was, it was a Christian revival. revival. I mean, there were thousands of people in this one town in, in Africa that we went past, thousands of them, that wanted to hear the word. You think what, when he talks about the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, as the Lord of the harvest, harvest means when something is done growing that's right, and they hear the that. You think? Do you think he was perhaps talking about the end times? I think I think it's the case of now, but not yet. Yeah. The kingdom is now, but not yet. So I think it's a Okay. Go out and and uh, bring in the harvest now. You know, go out into the fields now. It's an ongoing harvest. That makes sense. That will that will be completed at the end times. When he talks about the Lord of the harvest, I was thinking of God. Yes. Could it be that uh, he's saying? Um, the good news is plentiful. We've got the word here. We have, we don't have enough people to spread it. Well, in, in Isaiah chapter 6, uh, and um, in verse 8, he says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and, and whom will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. The message, I mean, we're all, um, it's our job, we were told, to go out and make disciples of other people in, in the book of Acts. Call to the mission. So all the crowds were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Do we feel that way today? Yeah. I don't, no, feel, I don't feel harassed. Well, you don't. Or do we feel like people maybe in the in the crowds, yeah. not part of the church or something like that? You see on the news in Philadelphia where all the hot rodders got out in the street and they're just terrorizing people and carrying on and somebody had a flamethrower and I mean that's that's those are lost sheep. And there's no absolutes there, there's nothing to follow. I I keep thinking the time, the time and the place where Jesus and his disciples were. Rome was had the upper hand, and they they were the Jewish people were harassed. Mm -hmm. Because all they all Rome was about was keeping peace in the Palestine that 
carry in the world. That's all they cared about. That's why they have plenty there. Herod and, and the Pharisees, I mean, they were all revolting to Rome. And then it says, Jesus gave the disciples authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. That's always kind of, always kind of strikes me, you know, like the, the disciples were able to do that. And I don't know if you guys seen the, the videos where they have, you know, preachers that claim to heal people, oh, bring yes. them up front and that kind of thing. And, um, I don't have that. <laughs> so, you know, not for lack of trying. <laughs> I don't think my faith is, you know, too low or anything, but it just kind of makes me wonder, you know. Isn't that, wasn't that one of the gifts? I mean, each person's given a gift. Isn't the gift of healing one of the gifts? And I wonder if I also sometimes I wonder a lot of times when I go to pray with somebody before their the surgery or something, I pray that the doctor uh, that mm -hmm. God would uh, use the doctor and the mm -hmm. and the people there working uh, to bring healing. Yeah. I wonder if God uses you know uh, medical education and science mm -hmm. to. People's brains to help figure that stuff out to bring healing to other people. Ooh, seems like there's more, you know, healing folks today with with modern medicine. Well, somebody had to teach those people. Right. Yeah. But I, I, I don't. I think there are people that are given the gift of healing. Mm -hmm. I mean, about the people you see on TV or you know, it's kind of dramatic and you know but I I think I haven't witnessed it but I think some people are given that gift. Mm -hmm. Um it's it's funny that they're given the authority over unclean spirits and cast them out and heal every kind of disease and sickness and and yet they <laughs> They went out and did this, and then the number of times they still questioned who he was, what he was. Um, and, you know, and, and Simon Peter you know, denied him three times. Mm -hmm. now, how can you, I guess I just can't wrap my head around experiencing the ability, given the ability to do that, and then still doubt. I don't know, was it down? I don't know. Don't you think that was Peter's assignment? To do to do what he did? To deny? Yeah, I always well, thought, well, if he didn't, am I going to be crucified right next to him? You know, if I let them know that I believe in him and I'm his follower. Well, the, 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 I think that's what it was. I think it was self-preservation. Yeah. It was oh, yeah. instinct oh, yeah. kicked in. Yeah. And at the minute the rooster crowed, he realized. What he had done. And then he wept because uh -huh. he yeah. realized that he had. I've always thought that, that he was protecting himself. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't that he didn't believe in Jesus. No. was. Because no. he was the one to say, you're the son of God. Yeah. Well, Jesus said that the shepherd will be struck and you will be scattered. Sheep will be scattered. And you, you know, we'll get to this, you know, later on in this text. But um, Peter was eventually crucified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tradition says he was crucified upside That's down. Yeah. In Rome, he was crucified under Nero. Uh, the uh, list of disciples. So I have this really neat little chart here. I could pass this around, but um, that has the different lists of disciples throughout the New Testament. Um, there, there seems to be more than 12 
apostles. Of course, Paul called himself an apostle, you know, um, and named some other some others, like James, the brother of Jesus, that may have been added on later, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, we have uh, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean or Simon the Zealot. Um, I guess the Cananean word is, uh, has, comes from the root word for zealous, so, and not Canaanite, I guess. Uh, it's different. Um, and then Judas, of course, Judas Iscariot. Um, same pretty much in, in Mark. Um, and then Luke mentions a, a Judas, the son of James, somewhere in there, uh, instead of Thaddeus. So, and then of course, Matthias in Acts is chosen to replace Judas. Yes. Yeah. And then John is just kind of all over. John doesn't name all of them. So, but, um, you know, it's important that there's 12. It's important there's 12. There's 12 tribes of Israel and 12 disciples. Number 12 is important. Be interesting if each one of them by chance came through the lineage of each tribe of each of the 12 tribes. Be interesting. We don't know a lot about them. Mm -hmm. Um I have a little footnote here. It says, a good summary of what little can be known about the apostles from history and legend is found in Hans Konzelman's History of Primitive Christianity. <clears throat> I would try to find an Amazon link and send that out to the group in History of Primitive Christianity. That's not one that I own. That's on my library. I think I'd like to add it. But wouldn't that be just like God to make sure that they all... Hmm. Represented the twelve tribes. That's one of the questions you can ask. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Beth. Hi, Beth. We are just getting into the list of the disciples, so just at the beginning here. Oh, okay. This All one. right. Thanks. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, uh, so we just read the last couple verses of chapter nine and the first four verses of chapter ten, which gives us the list of the disciples, the apostles. And I'm saying they're mostly the same in Matthew and Mark. In Luke, substitutes Judas, son of James, instead of Thaddeus. Um, and then John, John has you know Peter and Andrew, and then. Um, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and Philip, and Thomas, and Judas Iscariot. Um, and then, but then also mentions Nathaniel, which we don't get in the others. Uh, and then doesn't really mention much else. Um, Paul, in his letters, obviously mentions Peter, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, himself as an apostle. And then two other apostles, Andronicus, and some Romans chapter 16, um, and Junia, also in Romans chapter 16. Um, so they may have been added on at a later later time. Um, so History of Primitive Christianity by Hans Konzelman. I'll find a link and send that out in case anybody want to, wants to check it out. That's uh, summary of what little can be known about the apostles from history and legend. Well, should we get into what Jesus says to them, to us? Start with verses 5 through 15, first section. I'll read. Thank you, Carol. Jesus sent these out and commanded them, don't go among the Gentiles or into a Samaritan city. Go instead to the lost sheep, the people of Israel. As you go, make this an announcement. Make this announcement. The kingdom of heaven has come near. 
heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with skin diseases, and throw out demons. You received without having to pay, therefore give without demanding payment. Workers deserve to be fed, so don't gather gold or silver or copper coins for your money belts to take on your trips. Don't take a backpack for the road or two shirts or sandals or a walking stick. Whatever city or village you go into, find somebody in it who is worthy and stay there until you go on your way. When you go into a house, say peace. If the house is worthy, give it your blessing of peace. But the, if the house isn't worthy, take back your blessing. If anyone refuses to welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet as you leave that house or city. I assure you that it will be more bearable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on Judgment Day than it will be for that day city <clears throat> these are difficult instructions yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so nowhere among the gentiles oh, in this translation mm -hmm. go nowhere among the gentiles mm -hmm. after no town of the Samaritans but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel That sounds kind of exclusive. Mm -hmm. It does. I think we have to read this in light of in Matthew 28 at the end, Matthew 28, uh, verse 19. Go, there, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So this is Jesus giving this command not to go among the Gentiles before Easter, before the Passion. And then after the resurrection says, go and make disciples of all nations. But at the same time, this is being written after Easter for Matthew's church. I don't think the church was born, but I have an issue. Okay, I admit it. I don't think the church was fully established till like 200 CE. Mm. So I have a real issue when we keep referring to the church, the church, the church. This wasn't even 100 years after Jesus had been crucified and risen. I, I really, well, there really was Paul's in uh, Paul. You know, he went with the church is established. Well, when we say church, we don't mean like yeah, big yeah, church, yeah. Okay. capital C establishment. We mean the word ecclesia, which simply means assembly, okay. gathering. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I yeah. think we should emphasize it's church with a small c. Yes. Because it really grates me when we talk that it's exclusionary to, that's how the Jews got shut out. Well, I think what's going on here with Matthew's small C church mm -hmm. is they're getting shut out. They're getting shut out of the synagogues, you know, and and that's their experience, you know, because he says, you know, I mean, we're about to read uh, read into it here a little bit. When you're dragged um, before the councils mm -hmm. and flogged in in the synagogues, you know, he uses that word synagogue. Or synagogue mm -hmm. and makes a distinction between that and ecclesia. Matthew has both those words, it's two different words. Um, and so I think what's happening is in Matthew's time, the Jesus followers are the minority. They are mm -hmm. the ones being shut out from their ancestral religion, their Judaism. Um, and that's probably really hard for them. They're following this radical person, and so they're going to be shunned by others who don't want to follow that. Yes, I think, you know, Jesus is saying, you know, still go to Israel. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the mission started with Israel. We, they, he wanted them to go to all the towns in Israel and preach the good news. And He had to get it established there. You couldn't just go out to everywhere. 
in the beginning. I, I think you had to establish it in Israel first and then start branching out. And that didn't happen until after his death. No. Right. I think, and I think, I think it was, he was more concerned about the coming kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, he, he does say to Peter, you know, on this rock, I'll build my church, but I I kind of feel like he was more concerned with pre preparing people for the kingdom of God coming than, you know, establishing something that was going to last thousands of years. Well, I think he expressed what he wanted to do when, uh, in Nazareth when he read Isaiah. And he said, today, this prophecy is fulfilled. But to bring light to the people and freedom and so forth and so on. I go back in Isaiah 61, but that was his purpose. He's saying the people. Is but, he referring to just the Jews? Well, I think it's... It says here... Go nowhere among the Gentiles, nor the Samaritans. It's, that, it just, I don't understand that. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't get it. It's like, when did he change his mind mm -hmm. about, when, you know, when did he change his mind about the message for all people? Mm -hmm. I don't think Chris. he mind. I think he had to first develop a following among the Israelites before it could go out to others. Beth, you were going to say something? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say it kind of uh, clears it up a little bit in uh, my Bible in the footnote. It says that um, the question is why withhold news of salvation from the Gentiles and Samaritans? And the authors say that the, Jesus' intent was not to exclude, but to prioritize. God's plan of salvation originated with the Jewish people, and Jesus, the Messiah, was a Jew. Later, Jesus would commission his disciples to go to the entire world. So they, they think he was prioritizing. He wanted his own people to know first. And it was rejected in his hometown. And then when he stood uh, and looked at Jerusalem and he said, you know, how I, I wanted to gather you under my wings like a, a hen gathers her chicks. Uh, his own people rejected him own nation. Yeah. Yeah, my commentary says um, the disciples are sent to Israel, all Israel, and only to Israel. Historically, the disciples were reluctant to go to the Gentiles even after Easter, so that it took a considerable time for the church under the guidance of the Spirit to develop a Gentile mission and become an integrated church. The sending of the disciples exclusively to Israel corresponds to the mission of the historical Jesus, and it's important in Matthew's theological story. After Easter, the Great Commission ends this restriction by extending the mission to all nations. Uh, since Jesus' previous prohibition of having contact with Gentiles and Samaritans was no longer valid for Matthew's own post-Easter situation. He could have omitted it or declared that it was abolished. Instead, he preserves it because it is valid for the time of Jesus. In Matthew's view, the mission to Israel was not abolished by the later command that lasts until the end of the age, as though the church no longer carried on a mission to the land and people of Israel. The previous mission was taken up into the ultimate missionary mandate of the risen Lord and is thus not abolished but fulfilled. Um, all the specific commands and limitations connected with it were rescinded. I guess later in Acts. Or... Yeah, 
says to Peter, nothing. But don't declare unclean, I made clean. A difficult one to interpret. That's for sure. Now, MacArthur says uh, Christ does not forbid the disciples to preach to Gentiles or Samaritans if they encounter them on the way, but they are to take the message first to the covenant people in the regions nearby. Uh, and he you know, when he talks about the lost sheep of the house of Israel, um, Jesus narrows his priority even more when he says the gospel is only for those who know they are spiritually sick and need a physician. Another point of view. He says, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town. So that is, that's pretty close to forbidding them. I mean, think, Jesus yeah. is saying it. Mm -hmm. It's like a people, but anyway, that just yeah. And you know, I guess I was interpreted it as you know for this time, you know, this time, because then later he does say, "Go and make disciples of all nations," and that's later. Um, and they're supposed to, but then then do I interpret the rest of it as meaning, you know, only in that time and not today because, you know, um, go and, and don't take any payment. You know, I'm kind of very clearly in violation of that. Um, well, it says the worker is worthy of his support. And, and later on, Paul talks about supporting yeah, those people. Yeah, we did talk about that when, when we did Corinthians yeah. a couple years ago. Yeah, yeah. about um, clergy and yeah. So you know, pay. So um, it's your profession. It's what you do. And, and well, you yeah, should, yeah. I mean, you this know, is, the, the worker sticky. is worthy of his support. It gets into a sticky wicked thing. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay, now you said you're, you're getting paid. Right. And we all understand, or you're not getting paid. This is the sticky wicket part. They do not believe that the Methodist Church doctrines are. You probably would have been working here. Mm -hmm. So, how far do we take the sticky wicket? I mean, um, as far as the man-made doctrines that we've developed among all different churches. Not, I'm just, I'm not singling out Methodist, but there's a lot of man-made doctrines by the thousands of church in this country. So you can see the dilemma a little bit about receiving payment. Mm -hmm. So that's just a thought. Well, here we have the famous line also, you know, they don't listen to you, shake the dust off your feet mm -hmm. as you leave. Um, it was customary for the Palestinian Jew returning to the sacred land to shake off the dust of pagan countries before entering the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where that reference comes from. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Well, uh, Chapter or verse 15 gets into some end time way yeah. in the future. Day of judgment. Yep. Yeah. But and so this is all about hospitality, right? If they don't welcome you, it's about welcome and not being welcomed, receiving the words and not receiving the words. And uh, remember when we studied Genesis that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, we tend to focus on the, the homosexuality aspect, mm -hmm. but the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is explicitly in hospitality. And it says it right in Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. They they were 
you know, <laughs> um, very not hospitable. To the angels there. Um, and it, hospitality was a huge thing in that part. It still is in that part of the world. I feel like it should be here, but I think there it's very, you guys were there. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, yeah, we had uh, dinner at the Palestinian Christian home, very hospitable in Bethlehem. People in Bethlehem. And I took, uh, one time I took a uh, vehicle to Chicago for Krieger, a very Orthodox Jewish family. Mm -hmm. And they invited me in and they food, they offered food, a uh, place to lay down and take a nap from my long trip. And I mean, just anything and everything. Very hospitable people. Certainly Paul experienced some um... Some very hospitable people and some very inhospitable people on oh, yeah, his, yeah, his journeys. Yeah. Well. Not meaning the same thing, but we did a lot of shaking the dust off last week. <laughs> 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 Boy. Yeah. I think it's also good to refer to people. <clears throat> If you tried telling the good news, or as we refer to it, witnessing, mm -hmm. and you're constantly made fun of or mm -hmm. argued with, and after that happens over and over and over again, it's like give it up. Mm -hmm. And I like to look at it as okay, I've done I've done my part. Maybe and they've known what I said or what the spirit said through me. So yeah, leave, leave, and then someone else maybe will reap the harvest of what the spirit planted through you. Because I've had it in my own family. We love them, but there comes a point where you have to say, okay, this is this is it. But you don't you don't know what seed you might exactly plant. exactly and and something somewhere down the road could trigger that and somebody else will yeah. take that mustard seed perhaps it you plant it through the spirit yeah. and bring them around and you don't let them stray for them to yeah what finds God. I think it's a good reminder, and I think I think sometimes the temptation is to get angry at people. Yes. And and I see that a lot, and I you know I kind of feel like that maybe drives people even further from mm -hmm. the church and to just say you know when I when I read shake the dust off your feet, my connotation in my mind is just a mm -hmm. kind yes. of kind of mm -hmm. like a that uh, kind of a. Wash your hands up there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, sign language. <laughs> is that what that means? Is sign language? Well, pretty much. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Finished with you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's a non retaliatory non retaliatory uh, response. Yeah. Well, I think he's saying too that. Uh, Along that shake the dust off your feet thing, it is just that you're not you're not going to reach everyone. You're not going to reach everyone. I used to have student teachers that would come in, and man, they're just going to set the world on fire. And I say, slow down, slow down, do the best you can, but you're not going to reach everybody. Mm -hmm. You might as well settle on that fact right? or, you, or you're going to wake up to a rude awakening um, and, and i'm sure in, in your line where you're not going to reach everybody no it's very true what you just said very much resonated yeah, yeah. you're not going to you know, reach everybody there's some folks i you know i've tried i i think of you know 
tried and tried and tried and tried and at a certain point you just you know I've done all I can <laughs> yeah. but going back to you don't know what seed you might have planted that somewhere somebody something may trigger that down the road and nine times out of ten you won't you won't ever know you'll That's never right. see you know. you'll never see the result right. yeah uh, the Concordia that I'm reading along with the text here uh, has an interesting take on shape the dust off. It mm -hmm. says, a symbolic act practiced by the Pharisees when they left an unclean Gentile area. Here it represented an act of solemn warning to those who rejected God's message. I'm not sure I get that out of it out of the text of Matthew, but... Uh, I think, yeah, I think he's kind of saying, because, because they're going to... I think this is where this first couple of verses come back in. They're not going among the Gentiles and the Samaritans. They're going to towns in Israel and preaching the good news, and if they're not welcomed or listened to, then they shake the dust off their feet. That's, that's going to mean something to the people in the towns of Israel, whereas people in the Gentile Samaritan towns may not know. But they're going to be wondering, wait, why are they shaking the dust off their feet? We're still in the Holy Land. And so that could be, that's saying something. Solomon. Yeah. 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 That's probably saying well, something to them. And then he said it'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. It, it to me is kind of saying, you've done all you can. Don't worry about them. God will sort it out. God take care of it. Um, and we get another uh, a section on how just how hard discipleship is going to be. Verses 16 through 23. Somebody read that for us. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore, be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in that knowledge, in their knowledge. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and for the Gentiles. But when they deliver you, up, take no thought of how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you to in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father, which is speaking in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents, and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, that he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another, for verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the city, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Okay. Thank you, Mary. And certainly, I got to think that Matthew's community, little church, is going through some of this stuff. And so to to hear it, read. I don't know if, you know, Matthew wrote this and then is reading it in the house churches or, you know, if they're circulating it and reading it. Um, but to hear this uh, and that Jesus said this, I don't know, maybe may a little encouraging. Maybe not. I don't know. How would you feel? If you were going through this kind of persecution, um, and and you hadn't heard 
that Jesus said this before, and then suddenly, you know, you, you get wind of this is something that he said would happen. into the next town. <laughs> Make it sense. <laughs> Just a warning too, that it's not going to be easy. No, it's not. People are not going to be falling all over you just because you know who you are. Mm -hmm. And you, you just be ready. And because you're going to run into all kinds, they probably all men will hate you because of me, but you can't start me. Easy to say, probably not so easy to. But it's also very comforting when we're reminded that um, we're not being left alone, that the Lord is with us and will guide us through these times. He says, <clears throat> when you're handed over, don't worry about what you're going to say, but the Spirit of your Father will speak through you. Many times when you're with someone and trying to get across your point, you're witnessing or whatever, you, you go home and you think, oh, I don't know, but I, you know, I probably botched that. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, but you, know, you don't know what the Holy Spirit Somehow they heard from your mouth through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I know that sounds weird to say that. No, no, I say that all the time with my yeah. sermon because yeah. I sometimes think that I've done a really poor job yeah. with my sermon and somebody will come up to me and say, that really spoke to me. And then yes. yeah. I know it wasn't me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. And then you think of Stephen. And, and mm -hmm. I think of Stephen when they, oh. The speech. Oh, I was just going to say that the speeches that you read the, the, yeah. that they they made when they were put on the spot. Yeah. I think that is comforting. You're right. <laughs> you know, the word for handed over that's used here is the same word they use for when Jesus is handed over. What was that? Um, paradidomai. Yep. Paradidomai. Hmm. What is that? It's a Greek word meaning. Uh, handed over. So when it says they will hand you over, uh, okay. or when they hand you over, it's the same word that when Jesus says the the Son of Man must be handed over. It's the same word that uh, means betrayed. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Judas betrayed. So linking the disciples persecution with what happened to Jesus. The only one who died naturally, I guess, was John. I don't know a lot. Let's get that book. Yeah. I'm trying to remember who I'm trying to didn't Thomas Thomas went to uh, oh, no. India, I think. I don't know if he was martyred. Um, this section about brother will betray brother, father, his mm -hmm. child. I wonder if that was happening. That, you know, people were, um, it, people were still part of the synagogue, but then family members had been converted, were believers, mm -hmm. and were attending these these were house meetings at night under cover mm -hmm. of dark um, to, to share the stories of Jesus and to, to worship. And, you know, I wonder if this is, this was happening that family members were finding out and handing them over to the synagogue mm -hmm. to be punished or I guess put to death well, even. Probably was. I mean, look at Nero. He tried blaming that fire on the Christians and <clears throat> People were threatened by change. Mm -hmm. you look at what happened in Germany in the uh, 1930s and 40s with the Gestapo. And, and the, the Gestapo couldn't have done their job had it not been for the people that were 
turning other people in. And the church standing by. Mm -hmm. On top of the rail. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, just like. Well, sad. Jesus said, uh, he said, uh, I'm going to pierce your heart with a sword and divide your house. He you knew what was going to happen. It's sad when, when you have a member of your family that uh, will just, you know, they'll, they'll poo poo what you're saying. Just, I don't want to hear it. I'll start preaching at you. Because you love the people. Written by what they don't know, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, somebody who would hand you over to you harm because they don't you know, believe the same way that you do. You know, but it, what you're saying now just makes me think of poor Springfield. And making the stories up about the cats and the dogs and the and the poor people in Springfield. It was what an awful thing for them to have to go through. Yeah. Turning one group against another and <laughs> been going on since 2016. <clears throat> <clears throat> I don't think it's been going on since the beginning of time. Cain and Abel, right? I think I think when when the serpent said to Eve, Oh, surely you won't die, he planted that doubt. Doubting the word of God. This last verse, I think, is, is curious. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. I could not suss out what that's supposed to mean. I've got that underlined, so I must have ran into that same issue. Not, neither does my commentary, apparently. Harvest is, maybe the harvest is endless. Mm. There will always be someone not believing. Mm. Maybe, maybe that. You will not have gone through all the towns of this before this. In other words, there's always going to be division and unbelief. Is that is is this speaking to end I think so. With this yeah. coming of the Son of Man. <laughs> Because Israel's very secular right now. It's very secular. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's, and when Jesus finally comes on, on the Mount of Olives, people are going to realize then who he is, the whole world. And uh, I, I think there's going to be people in Israel that won't, won't believe until that day when he comes, which it'll be too late, but to be a remnant of Israel saved, but not all. And I'm, I'm thinking maybe this is speaking to the very end times. I don't know. That's what MacArthur said here. He said these verses clearly have a, a Chatological significance it goes beyond the disciples' immediate mission. The persecutions he describes seem to belong to the tribulation period that precedes Christ's second coming, alluded to in verse 23. So uh, it's like he was looking down the line according to this commenter.
Well, we're at eight o'clock. So let's take a break there. And Donna's brought our snack. Would somebody uh, care to get the blessing for us? Our Father, we give thanks for the time that we have been granted to come together to study your word. And we ask for enlightenment and we ask that we be filled with the Holy Spirit that we could better understand. We thank you for the snacks that have been brought by Donna and have come from the bounty of your hand. And we ask you to bless it to our nourishment for the betterment of your kingdom in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Beth, we'll probably, we'll come back about 820 or so. Today. Yeah. I had that shot yesterday. Yeah. Did you get that? Yeah. Yeah. Which one? Yeah. Which one? Yeah. About 6.30. Oh, yeah. I thought there was only one. We were supposed to. Tetanus. Tetanus. Oh, tetanus. Got my tetanus shot. Yeah. 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 Oh. It was, it was due this yeah. month. Been 10 so, years, 2014, so since I got it. Because so then they then said something at the doctor's office, my wealth check yesterday, and I said, you know what? I better go ahead and get that. You never know. You know. Oh my God. That's what they told me. Yeah. I got to get those. I and They were going to give me the flu shot there, but then I asked if they had the COVID shot, and they said they didn't have it. So I'll have to go to the pharmacy. So that took about 35 minutes. So that's not becoming Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A, it's a uh, respiratory virus. Uh, I guess it can really hit young babies and then really and then older older folks really are. But we did have a lioness that was breaking out of there. No concern for that problem that we had with that. And she was we stopped. Oh, 
Oh, yeah. Oh, I know. I know. I know. I when I was a kid, you know, one of my best pals passed away. And he was forever purple. Yes, I saw it. It was a wonderful thing when we were going Oh, yeah. We saw tons of the last one. My granddaughter was Yeah, I don't get I don't want to insult our hostess, but I don't know. No, it was too far out. Like a hyena. Jackal looks human family. We were a lot like a dog. My father is like, he had him with everything else. These trees look interesting. Oh, that's oh, that's why all the, it's so straight up. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, yeah, I've never seen one like that. That's an impala. We saw a lot of different kinds of. Um, that one's an Elon. Who knows it's a new, I think. A lot of different kinds. And I've got a really good image of it. Harry, are you going Thursday night to uh, a couple of spray jams? <laughs> I, I said, I don't know. Oh, you mean? Yeah, oh, yeah uh, no, Roger uh, Gordon. Oh, yeah. Thursday. Yeah, I don't think my unit had to be. We had it for a second. We had it for a Oh, we went to the location the first day. Yes, I know. I was, you know, you still got it, kid. Exactly. We have to get used to it. What are those days? Oh, they're the I'm <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Oh, that was the one. Yeah, he just such a nuisance. On the last day we were on safari, all of a sudden our power
thought there was one over here. Mm -hmm. and could be mixing names up. I think there is. Yeah. I didn't know. Oh, so there are there many. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, There's an Aladdin Cafe in Granville. Well, that's been there forever. Been there for a long, long time. Yeah. Saw the Buxton Inn was for sale again in Granville. Mm. Oh, really? I think I just saw that on the news the other night. Again? I didn't know it. When did the sell that? Uh, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but it's supposed but, to be haunted. One of those places. Oh, it's really? Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. I wish the Worthington Inn were still open. Yeah, I, I always enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah, it was nice. Yeah. I used to work at the Worthington Inn. <laughs> well, my first waitress job. Oh, boy, when they had a spread of Thanksgiving, oh, that was awesome. The last camp we stayed in, uh, the Lions Ball, they uh, were sitting out on the deck overlooking the, the Tour of our crater and uh, I had uh, appetizers. The guy was grilling coke. Oh. And uh, actually, it, it wasn't bad. It was uh, good. Uh, one, kind of one gal said, well, this piece is really chewy. I said, well, you got the old dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was bad. <laughs> that was tough. Did you eat, did you eat like ostrich? Or? No, no, we ate regular food, chicken. We had chicken every day oh, in our box. Wow. Like we had chicken. <laughs> <laughs> like chicken though. Who knows? We had, well, when did you know was standing there in the morning looking at some breakfast thing? She said, wonder what it tastes like. I just sat there and said, chicken. <laughs> <laughs> now, what did you give those kids that made their tongues blue? We didn't give them oh, anything. They had, some. they had lollipops from, from oh. the people there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they thought that was... Mm -hmm. They were showing me their tongue how blue it was. Yeah. They, they just, I'll tell you what, they just were starved for love. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, those kids just hung all over you. And, and they were fascinated with everything you had. And uh, how many of them from other, like from Sudan? Or? Yeah, it's all, yeah, they were all from there. Mm -hmm. But some of them, there were babies, too, not just. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just. Oh, my. And then we saw that they get uh, these motorbikes from China. They're like a 125 cc motorcycle. And they ride, they can get them for like a thousand dollars. And they ride these things everywhere. And <laughs> we saw a guy on, on his motor scooter or his motorcycle and his wife. It was a they, motorbike. It wasn't a motorcycle. Well, yeah, like a Honda or something. Anyway, they bought a piece of furniture like a television stand. And that thing was oh, about yeah. that long, right. about that wide. And she's right. holding me on the back oh, yeah. and, on, and then yeah. down the road they go. And uh, we saw them. You gotta do what you gotta do. Mm -hmm. they, they had everything on them. I mean, and sometimes they'd go by and there'd be three people on them and and uh, women carrying things on their head. Mm -hmm. Zigzag in and out of traffic, and you just close your eyes and think, oh my gosh, you're gonna get killed. And uh and they'd have a whole big to get through. rack of bananas, <laughs> green oh bananas on their head, or mm -hmm. maybe a great big basket. Yeah. Full of potatoes. We went by produce There's markets so produce. that they had. I mean, beautiful produce, mm -hmm. cabbages, and, uh, tomatoes, uh, just potatoes, carrots. My God, watermelon. We saw, we saw bags of bananas, just mm -hmm. tons of bananas. We saw uh, bags of potatoes and just uh, this high carrots and. They export a lot of that to Kenya, mm -hmm. uh, but beautiful fruit and, and vegetables and things that they had. Cow. 
camels and goats and, and sheep, and not sheep, um, donkeys. Donkeys, yeah. We saw camels. Well, one place had three camels. Three camels. <laughs> All right, let's uh, come back together. But it's still going to be here if anybody's still hunting before it's over the. Thank you, Donna. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, let's move on now to verses 24 through 33. The next section here 24 through 33. <clears throat> A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. But they have called the master of the house Beelzebub. <clears throat> How much more will they malign those of his household? So I have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, utter in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim upon the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Not one of them will fall to the ground without your father's will. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Thank you. All right. Disciple is not above his teacher, <laughs> nor slave above his master. I know, I was trying to say the same thing in my sermon on Sunday. <laughs> We're not above Jesus. Jesus had the most Humility uh, of anyone, really. So we also should be humble. But here, I think it's got a bit of a different meaning. So, what do you think he's saying to us in these verses? Like he's saying there's more to life than what's apparent to us that we can see. There's there's more to be understood beyond our hmm. human can, beyond words that we have. He's kind of saying, I think, um, do not put me as some uh, way above you. And do this, not aspire to be above me, but to be like me. Hmm. I don't see that in there. I want to draw a connection between verse 25 here and in chapter 9, verse 34. Pharisees say, by the ruler of the demons, he casts out the demons, or by the prince of demons. And Jesus says, if they call the master <clears throat> of the house of Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of this household? Mm -hmm. uh, they're calling me in league with Satan. They're going to say the same thing about you, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and well, and then 26 said, do not fear them for there's nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. I think I, I kind of look at that as, as, as vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And which, which he goes on through, um, you know, the Lord, therefore, we shall confess me before men, I will confess them before heaven, my Father in heaven, and those who deny me, I will deny before my Father. So don't, don't worry about those people that are going to call you names or put you down. Or kill you. Or kill you because well you know and, and, and Paul when they were in prison rejoiced that uh, that they were worthy to suffer. Well, I keep, I've heard my brother talk about it. he was in the military. It's kind of like God and Jesus got your six. Mm -hmm. the they got it. You know they've got your six. <clears throat> well, they're at this time, you know, they're they're they are meeting in secret. Not this time in the in the storyline, but that in when this was written, um, they're meeting at night. They're meeting in secret. And God kind of seems to be saying, you know, don't be afraid to come out and say it out loud. Say it boldly that, that you follow me. Mm -hmm. We saw a lot of that in Tanzania, um, especially on trucks across the front of the truck. It said, praise God or trust in the Lord, trust in Jesus. A lot of that displayed. They're not afraid. <clears throat> They've been through a lot in Africa. So many countries in Africa have been through so much. Uh, I'm sure that they were afraid of being drawn into the synagogue and even put to death under some of the persecutions that were going on. Mm -hmm. He says, don't fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. They fear him who can destroy both soul and body. Yeah, I look at the, if you go to uh, Hebrew, Hebrews 10 and 30, it says, for we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in heaven. I couldn't help but think of a couple of hymns when reading for chapter 10. <laughs> we have freely, freely. Mm -hmm. you know, freely you have received, freely give. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier on, verse 8, and then his eyes on the sparrow. <laughs> Here in this section. Yeah, I think this is this is a call to not be afraid. And it comes right after he's saying you're going to experience persecution. Mm -hmm. You're going to experience persecution. Uh, but don't be afraid because know where your eternal home is. And that it's important to acknowledge me rather than deny me, I guess. Well, because he said, everyone who, in 32 and 33, yeah. everyone who shall confess me before men, I will also confess him before my father who is in heaven. 
I mean, one feel persecuted during COVID when they suggested churches be closed. I mean, it, it's, I've talked to some people that thought that was persecution of the church. I didn't see it that way. No. I didn't either, but it's, <laughs> I think it, uh, we had a, as the leadership of the church, we had a decision to make. Uh -huh. um, we didn't feel like we were persecuting people. We knew that we were uh, probably going to make some people upset, uh -huh. but we also knew, we knew that if we kept the doors open, that people would come who could get sick uh -huh. and could die. Uh -huh. And we felt like, yeah. It was important for us to um, close the doors to protect them, but it wasn't that we we also didn't abandon people. Mm -hmm. Try not to. We we got the, the online church up and running. We got Zoom up and running. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a team of people making calls. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the folks. Um, and all that happened very rapidly. It happened yeah. very quickly. Yeah. It looked like it did in the schools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. very COVID, yeah. COVID hit like wildfire. Oh, no. yeah. And I think a lot of people were scrambling to try to come up with solutions to the problem of something that they've never dealt with before. And were mistakes made? Yes, no doubt. Uh, I think in any kind of situation, but it's similar to that. World. Yeah, it changed the world, and, and now we talk about pre-COVID and post-COVID. Uh -huh. Oh, back in COVID, you know, yeah. and probably the same yeah. thing happened uh, back in 1919 yeah. when the PC and PC. Yeah. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. I've talked to his family that they felt very persecuted. They thought this is a government trying to persecute the mm -hmm. church. I know there's people that felt that way. I mean, they were I, I no think that and I think that I, I think there were folks who didn't believe that it was real or, or that it was as bad as it was. Um, obviously we got hit in our community. We called yeah. Patsy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, How many people did we lose in the church? Did we have anybody die? Specifically to oh, yeah. COVID, yeah. we had Patsy. Was the first one. And we had people adjacent. I don't know if we had any other members specific, specifically that died from COVID. I just remember. Yeah. We I had, remember anyone else. We and had right some that were family members of members. A couple of the nursing homes that were all already in a nursing home. Right. Because they yeah. went through the nursing homes so mm -hmm. fast. Yeah. And I don't know that any of those died from COVID specifically, we did have, have a lot of people die rapidly in succession, but they were all from different things. It was, it was a real thing. I mean, there, and because some people got sick and people died and, and everybody, and I, and I think the problem came along is that governments were trying to cover it up. Well, we did, and they were all trying to cover their behind on the thing instead of just fessing up to the fact that yeah, this oh, thing got out of a lab and, and it's here it's here. Yeah, we can hear it. forget on the news of refrigerated trucks in New York full of corpses. Mm. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Because they couldn't yeah. Bury, they couldn't bury them fast enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. But uh, yeah, that, that was depressing. Yeah, I was just so proud of this church yeah. for keeping everything going and rolling, exactly. and yeah. giving us something to hang on to. You know. Yeah. I was, uh, it was very proud of this church. It, mm -hmm. it was strange to sit at, say, your breakfast table yeah. and watch. Yes. On Zoom. So, and and we still have folks who um, come to church that way. You know, well, I do miss seeing them in person. Oh, they, yeah. they will come mm -hmm. online and they check in every, every day. And But consequently, because <clears throat> that technology was developed to be able to do church on Zoom, mm -hmm. Two years ago, this Christmas, when the had the that's right, I see that's right, that's right. <laughs> because you did we church all from your living room. I did church from my living room, and we watched the, it from Florida. We were able to do that yeah. because we already had the, the system in place. That's right, yeah. that's right. I felt I, so good yeah. to be a part of it, even though I was down there. Yeah, I, I don't think that 
um, we experience persecution today in the same way yeah. that they did back then. Um, yeah. There are there are some countries around the world where people still do yes. experience that kind of persecution, but in the United States, we yeah. do not. And, and persecution depended too on who who was governing the region. It did, yeah. It because was some governors big. were, yeah. Well, if they're not bothering us, we're not going to bother them. And then there were others that were just zealots for wiping them out. So depending on where you were at and the particular region, whoever was <clears> running <throat> that region how they felt about it. Somebody. And who was emperor at the time, it, it waxed and waned. Um, yeah, it did. Some, <laughs> some historians have said the persecution was exaggerated and didn't exist. And, you know, others, you know, Christians will say that it was full on persecution all the time. The truth is somewhere in the middle. It was, yeah. it was sometimes were, were not as bad, but there were depth. There were certainly, there were times when Christians were heavily persecuted, yeah. martyred, um, you know, executed for the, for believing in Jesus. Well, they say at the Colosseum that, uh, yeah, there were some Christians that were thrown to the lions, but it wasn't that frequent. And sometimes I think, <laughs> well, oh, we have it wrong. Wrong. it's a few. Only a few. Well, well, the lions probably make it out like a cat. Yeah, they make out like a cat. <laughs> They make out like, you know, the gladiators are out there killing each other, which they didn't do that because these gladiators were, I mean, they were like NFL sports figures. Yeah. They had they were entertainers. groupies, they, they had people that were creating medals for them and selling stuff. You know, you know, we sell jerseys and stuff nowadays with people, they had medals and, and, and this old business said thumbs up, thumbs down. They didn't do that kind of stuff because it's, we're not going to, I'm not going to turn my thumb down on everybody's favorite. We'll have a riot going on here. I thought Mel Brooks had it right. They were, it was like shooting ski. They would catapult them in the air. Pull, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I, you know, I think certainly they were experiencing some persecution, uh, and it seems to me that, that, you know, maybe in Matthew's community there there's some some heavy persecution going on, mm -hmm. and and Jesus saying, yeah, that's this is going to happen, but don't be afraid. Yeah. Even if even if you end up going to the you know, the cross, even if you end up going to be martyred. Um, well, all, some of them were contemporaries of Paul, uh -huh. and he was persecuted. Right. Mm -hmm. So I guess you need to live with that. No. He's trying to get them to think mm -hmm. eternally. And, and, and because of that, to not be afraid. God still cares about you. And, you know, you will reward you in heaven. Um, and then he goes on in the final sections of the chapter here, verses 34 through uh, 42. And this is our final section. Somebody read that for us. Uh, do not think that I, that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life shall lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake shall find it. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. 
and whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of those little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. What is it out? You know, this, this, first, this verse gets brought up a lot of times, I think. And the, you know, do not think I've come to bring peace. I've not come to be, bring peace but a sword. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think Jesus is just advocating for indiscriminate violence. Um, we call him the Prince of Peace. So I, think, I think he is the Prince of Peace. But I think what he's saying is making a, a distinction, what we call between peacekeepers and peacemakers. Peacekeepers like the stormtrooper. They're there to keep the peace, <clears throat> make sure nobody gets out of line and there's no tension. Peacemaker is somebody who um, maybe creates tension, maybe upsets the status quo, but with the purpose of creating true peace. Um, Martin Luther King talks about it when he says true peace is not just the absence of tension, but also the presence of justice. So if you have a situation where there's an, an unjust situation, but there's no, there's no tension, there's no violence, that's not really peace. And so when people who are trapped in that unjust system, you know, create tension in order to try to get out of it, a lot of times the accusation is, you know, you're not being peaceful. Well, the situation itself is not peaceful. You can't accuse them of that. Talk about Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah. Um, so when he says, I've come to set a man against his father, daughter against her mother, daughter, daughter, daughter in law against her mother in law, that seems very stereotypical. What? One's foes will be members of one's own household. I think what he's he's not saying he just wants family members to fight against each other just because I you know like that. I think he's saying that my coming will create this tension because you know people will aspire to a better way, and that's going to create tension with the people who like things just the way they are because they currently benefit from them. Well, that's what he ran into for with, with the Pharisees, and all. they were currently benefiting from their program, and he was coming along and putting a fly in the ointment. So this guy's bad for business. We got we got to do something. And here, for the first time in Matthew's gospel, we get the word cross. Whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Hmm. I wonder what they thought when he said that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I, you know, I cross. had a kind of a moment when I was reading my commentary. The reader will be surprised by the abruptness of the reference to the cross for which there is no explicit preparation in the preceding narrative. From reading chapters one through nine, the uninitiated reader, that is, if you had no, no knowledge of the Jesus story and you were just for the first time reading through the Gospel of Matthew, and you got to this part here in chapter 10, the uninitiated reader would anticipate that the mission of the disciples would meet with spectacular success. But the discourse that begins with Jesus conferring his authority and power on the disciples concludes with the necessity of sharing Jesus's cross as well. I wonder what the, the, the Aramaic or Hebrew was for that cross. But he, what, what verse was that in? Chris? The cross is in verse 38. Okay. Um, and this would have been written in Greek. Okay. So if I was really a great pastor and remembered my Greek, I can tell you without having to look it up. Uh, this Concordia that I've been following says that uh, the first mention of the cross in Matthew's gospel, the cross was an instrument of death and here symbolizes 
the necessity of total commitment, even unto death, on the part of Jesus' disciples. Mm -hmm. Then it makes reference to a note on uh, Mark 8.34, which I'll take a look at. It may be the same, it may be the same text in Mark. Uh, Stauros mm -hmm. is cross in Greek. Mm -hmm. I just looked mm -hmm. it up. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, it's a metaphor for death. So that's why they trans. Chapter 16, 24 and 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. Mm -hmm. and saying the same thing here. Mm -hmm. I remember Matthew used uh, Mark. Mark was written before Matthew. So Matthew used parts of Mark to help him write his own gospel. Luke also did this. And then whatever that sayings gospel cue that was circulating around or the sayings of Jesus, there was a sayings that was mm -hmm. circulating throughout the we don't have it anymore. It's been lost to time, but uh, we know that something was going around because these guys you know, wrote down the same or pretty similar sayings. There's a verse follow that that follows that that I think is just wonderful. Mm -hmm. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world mm -hmm. and lose his own soul? Mm -hmm. yeah, Kind of goes along with what Matthew was saying earlier. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Fear him who can destroy both soul and body. I like that one. I pull that out a lot. <laughs> There's a contemporary Christian song. Um, I don't want to gain the world but leave my soul. I don't know if it's a song. Mm -hmm. oh, that's right out of Mark too. You know, I struggle. I, I really struggle with this. Whoever loves, particularly whoever loves son or daughter more than me, is not worthy of me. Yeah. I love my kids to death. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that doesn't change, Chris, just because no. they grow up into adults. No, no. It it's just different worries. Yes, it is. <laughs> More expensive problem. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I guess I just kind of have to constantly reevaluate or keep in mind, you know, what that means. Uh, you know, I can still love them, but what would it mean to love them to the abandonment of Jesus? I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> that's I'm, not right. sure, I'm not sure what that would. What that would look like. How would that be abandoning Jesus? That's what I'm saying. I don't know what that would mean. No. I can't imagine in any situation where I wouldn't love my children no matter what. They would get consequences for sure, but never stop loving them. And that's being a parent has taught me a lot about how God feels about me. I remember when, when uh, mm -hmm. our son said to me, he said, you always talked about unconditional love. And he said, I didn't know what that was until I had our daughter, until our daughter was born. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, you, you do anything for your children. But I think if you get to the point where you're doing things that are wrong, Mm -hmm. to support your children. Then you're loving your children more than you love God. That's a, that's a good point. You know, what about that uh, scandal where the actors were buying their kids' way into college or right. something like that? Yeah, that? Doing something like that. Yeah. yeah. And, and no doubt they love their children, but when you love them to the point where you're doing things that are wrong, isn't that kind of like a, a, a idolatry almost to the point? Mm -hmm. 
Isn't there like a TV, or I'm sure there's plenty of TV show or movie examples of parent that's saying, I, I did all this for you. And the kid's like, I didn't want you to do that for me. You know? Mm -hmm. Remember that song that went around <clears throat> by Meatloaf? There's a guy, he was a rock. He says, do anything for love, but I won't right. do that. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. It makes you think. As a classic. It mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that old Meatloaf song. I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. <laughs> and he doesn't oh. specify what that, that is. is. It, it could be the different thing to anybody. Uh, right. uh, we would all die for our kids. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Would. Yeah. Yeah. Would. Yeah. Would. Great children as well. Yes. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I was just driving my friend around today with Alzheimer's, and that was one of her That's favorite it. songs. <laughs> <laughs> that meatloaf song. She loved meatloaf. Um, yeah. Tell her we had meatloaf for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> Peter, Peter really comes to mind here this whole section really uh, this whole chapter peter um we talked about him earlier how he ended up denying jesus mm -hmm. and that was out of self-preservation and mm -hmm. you know and jesus says don't fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul everyone who acknowledges me i will acknowledge but whoever denies me before others i will also deny um Whoever does not take up the cross and follow me, and it's like, you know, Peter, he denied Jesus um, out of instinct. You know, I don't think he even realized he was doing it until he heard the rooster. Excuse me, bless you. Um, but he then he went on to lead a life that was fully devoted to Jesus to the point that he took up his cross literally and was crucified in Rome under Nero. He truly became the rock. Didn't he, didn't he request to be crucified upside down? He was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what John, yeah. John writes he at the end. So to speak, he said he wasn't worthy to be crucified. Yeah. yeah. He requested to be upside down? Yeah, because he didn't no. feel he was worthy to be crucified the way Jesus was. I didn't remember that. Yeah. In verse 40, he who receives you receives me, mm -hmm. and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Then I go there's back. a there's a, a another uh, re reveal, I guess I would say, about Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, and then and then John uh, chapter. 14 and verse 6, mm -hmm. he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. When you receive me, you receive the Father. And then uh, verse 42 reminds me that there's something we say in, in Stephen ministry. We talk about a cup of cold water what it means to offer a cup of cold water to somebody it comes from this verse whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of the site that doesn't necessarily mean children like little kids mm -hmm. but um he's, he's talking about maybe traveling um in matthew's time you know traveling missionaries traveling prophets And after after being out in, in, on a dusty road that we were just on a few days ago, and I mean dusty roads, man, a drink of cold water just hit the spot. Yeah. There's nothing better. But you could taste the dust. I wanted to read from the reflections on this chapter. It says... <clears throat> To many modern Christians, this speech seems strange, even fanatical. Yet in every generation, some disciples of Jesus have been in situations in which this missionary discourse, chapter 10, 
speaks directly the word of the risen Lord. Uh, it is only for first world mainline Christianity that this chapter as such may seem to represent another world with its talk of witness, persecution, poverty, and martyrdom. To the extent that it seems alien, it is a call to re-examine our own version of Christianity and ask whether we have remade the Christian faith to our own tastes, and whether it is possible to so change faith and have it remain Christian faith. From another perspective, this chapter need not be alien at all. It reveals in concentrated form what the Christian life essentially is, confession of God's act in Jesus, living toward the eschaton with a concern for mission in this world, letting go of both material possessions and fear of what others might think about us or do to us, placing a loyalty to the God revealed in Christ above all other loyalties, even the deepest ones of home and family, a life of non-resistance to violence, trust in God and God's future. The call to this life of mission is not directed to the 12 only. For Matthew, all disciples are apostles, all participate in the apostolic mission. Yeah. Can I say about the violence? Uh, non-resistance to violence. A life of non-resistance to violence. Oh, Mark Luther King again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Which he learned from Gandhi. Mm -hmm. And Nelson Mandela learned from Gandhi and Martin Luther King as well. If I could do all those years in prison like he did. Yeah. Oh my God. Any other final comments or questions or? <clears throat> I think we're in chapters 11 and 12 next time. Not quite the whole thing. We'll have to see. Uh, I will send it. I will send it out. Generally, I will do every couple of uh, every two chapters or so. Got to do all of them. Yep, eleven and twelve. Miscellaneous just ministry moments. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Miscellaneous ministry moments. So we'll go there next time. All right. Um, Norma asks for prayers for her friend Beverly. Um, so she's in terrible, constant pain.